8th session of first ever virtual conference on role of applied theater in india we are glad to welcome our speaker dr selena busby from london uk dr selena is a principal lecturer course leader that is ma applied theater and pg certification applied theater with young people at royal central school of speech and drama university of london she was awarded a national teaching fellowship in 2018 her research and practice focuses on theater that invites the possibilities of change both in contemporary plays and in participatory performances i request selena to present her research thought on finding utopia in varali kolivada an exploration of applied theater in an urban village over to you dr selena Thank you. Thank you for that lovely introduction. Just going to share my screen. I'd like to start by saying thank you to the Applied Theatre India Foundation and for Costa to inviting me to talk today. The topic of the conference is the role of applied theatre in Indian society. I don't feel qualified to talk about this immensely important topic so I'm not going to. I'm going to talk about the role of applied theatre in society more widely to start with and then in the second half of my presentation I'm going to talk about a project that I work on with my partners in Mumbai that makes theatre with the women of Worli Kolliwada. I've been working with applied theatre, drama education and drama community set in settings for since 1995 with different constituent groups that include teenagers in New York, men in prisons in the UK and women in Mumbai. I've used drama as a means of education and a means to effect change. I've also simply just made theatre with different people without an explicit agenda. The contexts, the settings and the locations of this work have varied greatly as have the ages of all of my participants. Since I started this journey, the policies that directly affect this work and its funding streams have also varied greatly and they've changed how those of us that make art in community settings do so. Internal debates in the discipline about the binaries of process and product, effect and affect have also had a major effect on our field. Not surprisingly, all of this has affected the thinking of the researchers and the practitioners who work with communities, either prioritizing one part of these binaries or trying to find a third way that accommodates both. For me, as a practitioner and a researcher, the manner of which I've named the work and defined the work has modified a great deal over the last two and a half decades. Currently, applied theatre is what I'm calling my work, although my practice might better be described as applied art practices. While the term applied theatre is not without, it, without its problems, it does in a very straightforward way describe the application of theatre to the real world. I would argue that applying theatre in non-theatre settings is an inherently political act. This is a principle that's underpinned my theatre making throughout my 25 years of practice. The other three elements that have remained steadfast through all of these years are first, throughout my time in working in the field, I've been troubled by the intention to change participants, which often appears to be a recurrent focus of the work. Secondly, an ethos of hope underpins my practice. And third, I define my practice within applied theatre as a search or rather a demand for social justice and equity. If anything, this final principle has grown stronger over the years and has positioned itself more centrally within my practice as the 21st century has progressed. While my practice is about issues of fairness on one level, the individual level, it rages against the waste of individuals' potential and their marginalisation. It's also about the wider social patterns of injustice, discrimination and oppression that generates such waste. 
I choose to focus my practice, sometimes directly and sometimes indirectly, on the injustice and unfairness experienced by some of the most socially excluded sections of society. Those whom anthropologist Aran Apajurai describes as being bare citizens. Apajurai uses this expression to describe the urban poor who have been pushed into a state of bare citizenship a state where their rights have been reduced or stripped back to the absolute bare minimum, such as those who might be classified as prisoners or refugees. For him, the urban poor who live in informal housing settlements, shelters, slums or on pavements, can be seen as bare citizens with no access to the rights and protections that are offered to regular citizens. They are those without, without disposable incomes and who cannot therefore consume mass-produced products or culture. And so in the words of Indian writer Arundhati Roy, without, they are without spending, without spending power and so they do not matter. When making theatre with bare citizens in prisons, homeless shelters, informal housing settlements, I understand and use the term social justice. To mean, three, to mean three things in line with equity, rights and responsibility, and merit. And I believe that making theatre with bare citizens addresses all three areas of, their, um, of these categories that make them bare citizens. With regard to social justice, it's not merely a lack of money. Um, it's not near, near, merely a lack of money or even poverty. It's a complex triangle of discrimination, poverty and exclusion that results in some people having less, being denied access and accepting disparaging treatment. It's an inequality that results in many individuals and groups being unable to participate in economic, educational and cultural society. Social exclusion is deeply ingrained throughout and across all societies and has become key territory for applied theatre projects that seek to make theatre with community groups, often in partnership with so-called marginalised groups, such as those at risk of offending, youth not in, a, in employment or education or training, those living with addiction, pavement dwellers and recently arrived immigrants and refugees. Thompson's discussion of the rights and responsibilities of the individual in the context of social justice and exclusion is connected closely with his notion of citizenship. For Thompson, social justice requires the rights and, responses, rights and responsibilities of people to be respected. Therefore, social justice is not only about economic values or even ensuring people's basic human rights are met, but it's about ensuring that individuals also have the opportunity to contribute constructively to their society. This can only occur if people feel a strong enough attachment to their community and care enough about it and the people within it to feel that they can take responsibility. Those living in poverty or those who have a minority status are often excluded from political spaces and forums and this can compound their sense of powerlessness. In the words of the World Bank, feelings of fairness, justice and being part of society can be manifestations of how much the society recognises, respects and listens to its members. Individuals need to have a sense of ownership of and feel they have a genuine stake in the societies in which they live. They must feel that they have the right to contribute to the development of its policies, rules and laws. In other words, to use an often overused and ill-conceived applied theatre term, people need to feel that they have a voice in their communities, but more than this, they need to feel that their voice will be heard. The idea of inequity as existing both implicitly and explicitly underpins my interest in making theatre and researching questions that disrupt power structures on both the micro and macro levels. The micro level involves challenging the internalised negative identities that are created for individuals, identities which impede their potential and their aspirational thinking, making them think that change isn't possible. On the macro level, I seek to invite the general public public institutions and policymakers to experience the harm that inequality, social exclusion, discrimination, lack of respect and dignity have both on individuals and on society. These are ambitious aims, 
but they're ones I continue to pursue, whether I'm working with adults or youth, and whether I'm working in the UK or internationally. The ethics and law scholar, Martha Musburn, believes that citizens cannot relate well to the complex world around them by factual logic alone. Art, and specifically theatre, provides a lens through which individuals and groups can process and reflect on their lived experiences of the world and offer a means of understanding and articulating the complexities that surround us both implicitly and explicitly. Theatre making, with the aims of social justice, enables people to find new ways of communicating their views, their discontent and their wishes. Neil Thompson claims that trust and a sense of security are part of a measure of social justice and that a society cannot be said to be fair and just if it leaves its most vulnerable citizens in a state of insecurity and mistrust. Theatre is one tool in our armoury that may help us relate to the complex world I have against the global domination of neoliberalism and the lack of justice, equity and dignity that it creates. So I, can so I intend to continue to use it for such aims. Since 2015, I've been defining my work as a pedagogy of utopia. I draw on Paul Ricoeur's work in which utopia doesn't mean a hope of a better place, but rather the ability to recognise one's current circumstances and from this understanding develop the desire and capacity to change these circumstances. Ricoeur claims that utopia isn't just a dream, it's a dream that wants to be realised. And this concept has become really important to me and is a catalyst for my practice. I use applied theatre to stimulate questioning of the real lived experience of the participants I work alongside, and this may create a desire for change. When talking about the utopian desire to change in connection with my practice, I wouldn't say that my intention is to make change happen, but rather to allow for the possibility of change so that participants might see that there's a potential for them to create change and choose to take it themselves. Ricoeur writes about the field of the possible, or a place where it's possible to re-examine what is in order to see what might be. In other words, the concept of utopia contains anticipation or the not yet. The not yet is the what might be, and this creates the possibility for change. A utopia then might be triggered when working with the women of Hawley Collywodder as we make site-specific theatre in the lanes of their urban village. While acknowledging that the lack of time and space in their daily routines for themselves and making theatre about this issue invites them to think about how they might like to use the spaces that surround them and how they might make changes to enable themselves to have better access to space in which they can relax, socialise and articulate their concerns about their society, about for them and for their children. Simultaneously, working on the project may raise their expectations and constructively challenge their self-identities as they see themselves and each other in a new light. They see themselves as playful, as artists, as theatre makers, as citizens with important issues that they want to talk about and share with others. Since 2004, my application of theatre has largely been in the form of long-term projects with specific communities or organisations. In 2017, I described this as a, deep, as a sustained, deeply embedded practice. Now, I would describe my work and the work of those with whom I research as being comprised of a series of sustained, deeply embedded social justice projects that occur within specific community settings. I don't wish to suggest that there's anything inherently problematic with short-term practice, practices and projects. Applied theatre is really not a single approach. It's not a toolkit. It's not even several toolkits all ready and waiting to be literally applied to different people in, with different aims and contexts. Since Judith Ackroyd first described applied theatre as an umbrella term in 2000, it has served as a really useful description for an overarching field. It's an umbrella under which can be found many diverse practices and theories. 
what works with one group might be a complete disaster with another group. Even the ethical codes of working with people vary depending on a range of factors that are individual, social, cultural, institution, institutional and political. When I look back over the five, uh, nearly 25 years worth of practice, I've discovered that five key tenets are really important in my work, whether I'm making theatre in prisons or with youth in specific contexts, or whether I'm working in India or whether I'm working in New York, that these five principles always apply because the foundations of making theatre alongside bare citizens remains the same even when the conditions surrounding the work differ greatly. I've started to outline these concepts as being partnership, integrated investment, aspirational thinking, articulation, third spaces and resistance. So my applied theatre creates utopic spaces in which different futures can be imagined and aspirational thinking can be invited. The foundation on which all of these are built is deeply embedded, sustained partnerships. The work in Worley Collywodder has developed out of a long-term project with Divya Bhatte. He and I planned a, a pilot project to bring the two of us together with young people from Darravi and Central, the university where I, I work, to make theatre together in about 2006. That pilot project is still running every year in one form or another. In the early days, we worked with the Darravi youth each year and now working on the Worley project, two of the young people in this photograph that you can see now, who are some of the original Darravi participants, now work with us in the Worley project. They're assistant facilitators and co-researchers within the project who are paid to, to, to take those roles. The long-term nature of this work has enabled them to continue to work with us and for us to continue to work with the same participants, often for over a decade. Some of the team members change each year and the NGOs that we partner with might change. But the long term collaboration is vital to this work and the way that it may invite change. Twelve of the youth from that project um, talked to us in 2019 about the ways the long term consistency of the work was a real benefit to them. And some of them can track where their current positions, jobs, lifestyle, support networks lead back exactly to this project. The partnership with Bhatia has enabled both of us to let our practices grow and develop together and find new ways of working that cross class, caste, culture, ethnicity, languages, injustices and allows for unexpected things to happen that can't happen in one-off or short-term projects. The long-term nature of this partnership has enabled us to explore the second principle of my work, which is issues surrounding social justice. There are no quick fixes to creating a more equitable society, but dependable partnerships with communities and, and team members means that you can start that long journey in a series of small steps. In Worley, the first year we made work with the women that celebrated their lives and the places in which they live. The women showed us the spaces they loved and those they did not love. We made work about the ones they liked, we made work about the ones they didn't like. We talked as a group about the things they wanted to change. One of these things was free time. They wanted more time to be without responsibility, just a small portion of each day where they didn't have to be responsible for something or somebody else. And so each day that we worked, the workshops created this space for them. And in the workshops, they talked about the worries they had for the future. They talked about how they were worried about their children being addicted to their cell phones and computer games. And they talked about their worries about lack of water and lack of space. While they did this, we were on, their, on our way to finding the third aspect of a pedagogy of utopia. This is one which centers around articulation and amplification or the giving and taking of perspectives. When we moved the work into a black box theatre space, they made performances about these concerns through short scenes, short theatre scenes, they articulated their concerns and through dialogue about the performance, they considered the way they could change their world and the things that they were worried about. 
The fourth element of the pedagogy of utopia is space. In fact, I call it third space. a slight technical glitch. In these photographs, you can see the different way that we used our third space. The photograph with the flip-flops and the shoes has become a really important metaphor for me about third spaces and the people that I work with. In this photograph, you can see what's sort of a jumble of flip-flops and shoes that's sort of a jumble, but at the same time ordered. When I look at this photograph, I can recognize I can recognise the specific shoes that belong to me, that belong to Divya, that belong to the participants that have been with us for nearly, um, nearly 15 years, and many of the individual women. So, with it, so there's a mass of shoes that are all on an equal footing, they're all on an equal level, and yet they each retain their individuality, which is really important to the concept of the third space for me. Drawing on the writings of Edward Soja to outline the geography of a third space and Homi Baba to outline the concept culturally, I argue that safe spaces and brave spaces in applied theatre should be replaced with the concept of third spaces. Spaces where two groups or more can come together on an equal footing with neither taking priority. They're spaces of mutuality and equity. In Whirly Collywodda and previously in, the, in Daravi, Divya and I brought together communities from informal settlements in Mumbai with students from Central. And together they learnt to make theatre, to share their different experiences and their different worlds. They listened to each other, they played together, they swapped stories and songs and games and dances, and they made theatre together on an equal footing. Another nice metaphor for a third space is this uh, feast that became a regular occurrence in the workshops uh, at Whirly Collywodda. This image of the food we shared in the workshop space with each participant bringing something created a mixed feast of food that included idli, chutneys, sambals, curries, samosas and the students' contribution of pesto pasta, which is less appealing than most of the other things that arrived. But the sharing of food has become a really important part of my practice that started in Daravi with the youth and Divya. When each workshop there we would stop, in each workshop there we would stop for chai midway through. In these moments of tea and often snacks, the students and the young people talked about films, they talked about music, they talked about and they talked in a mix of Hindi, Maharati, English and mime. A lot of gestures, a lot of laughing. And during that process, they became friends, despite their differences, and the theatre work became stronger because of this. The fifth aspect of a pedagogy of utopia is resistance, or geographies of resistance. By exploring how this practice creates spaces that resist inequity and resist neoliberalism. Last year, the women of near, uh, Whirly Collywodder wanted to make site-specific work about lack of space. In this project, the women created site-specific performance work about their hopes for the spaces that they had now, live, were living in now, and how they wanted to use them in the future. They made four short performances in the lanes of their urban village. Each told a story of how they used outside spaces when they were children for playing how they use them now as places to move through quickly as they deliver food to family members or take children to school or how they're, how they're spaces that they need to clean and maintain and tidy. Each performance ended with a scene showing how they would like to use those spaces in the future. As spaces for shared learning.
as they made these pieces of theatre, they started to make plans about how they could change and adapt the spaces of their everyday lives so that they could use them more in line with the ways that they wanted to. They talked through the issues, they shared theatre, they talked about changing their world. And as we made this work in the lanes of the village, people stopped to watch, curious to see what was happening. And without planning it, the women suddenly were telling their community what changes they wanted to make happen. They were showing them physically what that change might look like. And for me, that's the role of applied theatre in society today. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Selena, for sharing your valuable time with us. Your research observations may support to build thoughts of all practitioners in the field of applied theater. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. This was the last session for today. Thank you all for connect with us on FB, Insta, and YouTube. See you all tomorrow at 12 noon. With speaker, Dr. Radhika Jain from Bangalore. Stay with us. Thank you and bye-bye.